Let's get started. Welcome to the September 4th, 2024 licensing committee meeting. My name is Song O, chairperson of the committee. Before we convene, I would like to remind everyone present that the board is a consumer protection agency charged with administering and enforcing pharmacy law. Where protection of the public is inconsistent with other interests sought to be promoted, the protection of the public shall be paramount. The hearing room also, just a reminder, is connected to the meeting, uh, but the video is not working and that the staff and council are present in the hearing room. As I facilitate this meeting, I will announce when we are accepting public comment. I have advised the meeting moderator to allow three minutes to each individual uh, providing comments. We will begin with public comments uh, attending in person in Sacramento, if any, and followed by public comments by individuals participating via WebEx. This approach is necessary to facilitate this meeting. Before we get started, I would like to ask staff moderating the meeting to provide general instructions on the process for providing public comment via WebEx. Sarah? This is the moderator. Uh, when public comment is requested, I, the moderator, will turn on the WebEx question and answer feature to facilitate this. Comments should be limited to the topic addressed during that specific agenda item. Instructions will be displayed on the screen each time, and uh, you may click on the question mark, typically at the lower right-hand corner of your WebEx screen, type the word comment into the text box, and then click send for your request to be recognized. You may also choose to raise your hand by clicking the hand icon at the bottom row of your computer's WebEx screen, or if you're an audio only participant, you can press star three on your device to raise your hand. You will then be given uh, three minutes to speak with a 10 second warning. And at the end of the, your time, your microphone will be muted and we will move on to the next person requesting public comment. I believe that is all my instructions. Thank you, Sarah. I would like to take a roll call to establish a quorum. We have everyone on today. I'm so excited. Um, starting with Trevor Chandler. Here. Thank you, Renee Barker. Licensee member present. Morning, Jesse Crowley. Licensee member present. Love your classes as always, Satinder Sandhu. Licensee member present. Good morning, Satinder Jason Y. Public mem member, good morning. Good morning, Jason. I am here. Quorum has been established, members. We have a, a one agenda basically, but still very. Um, Full discussion today. I ask everyone participating today to be respectful of the work before the committee. We encourage participation by members of the public throughout our meetings at appropriate times. The committee respectfully requests that when comments are provided, they're done so in a professional manner, consistent with how the committee conducts its business. And before we move to the next agenda item, I'd also like to remind members uh, participating via WebEx to please remain visible on camera throughout the open portion of the meeting. If you need to temporarily turn off your camera due to challenges with internet connectivity, please remember to announce a reason for your non-appearance when you turn off your camera. Next, agenda item two, public comment for items on not on the agenda or items for future meetings. And I ask the moderator to open the line for individuals to provide the opportunity to provide public comment on items not on the agenda. You're not required to identify yourself, but may do so. I would also like to remind everyone that the committee cannot take action on these items except to decide whether to place an item on a future agenda. Accordingly, if your comment pertains to an item on today's agenda, please save your comment for the public comment period specific to that agenda item. Members following review of the public comments for this agenda item, I will ask members to comment on what, if any, items should be placed on a future agenda. As a reminder, this agenda item is not intended to be a discussion, rather an opportunity for members of the committee and members of the public to request consideration of an item for future placement on an agenda, at which time discussion may occur. Um, I am hearing there are no body in Sacramento. So Sarah, we're ready for a WebEx. All right, this is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment for items not on the agenda, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. And it looks like we do have uh, several people who have requested, so I'll go in the order received. Um, first, I have Jackie Stover. Jackie, you'll be get, uh, 
I will request to unmute your microphone. You'll be given three minutes to speak and a 10 second warning. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. Ms. Jackie Stover, I'm a specialty pharmacist and I just wanted to take this time again to say thank you to the Board of Pharmacy for their continued efforts in securing an author to sponsor the amended section 4071.1 of the Business and Professions Code, specifically sections E and F as it relates to remote processing. We are very anxious for the Board to provide us with some good news once an author has been secured and would like to know if there is anything that we can do to help expedite the process. Thank you. Thank you for the comments, Jackie. All right, this is the moderator. Next we have Anais Anton. And Anais, you'll be given um, three minutes to speak and a 10 second warning. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. I'm a California licensed pharmacist and I work for a specialty pharmacy. We all want to thank the board for their continuing efforts in trying to secure an author to sponsor the amended section of 407101 uh, of the business code and profession, especially sections E and F as they relate to remote processing. Uh, we would like to know if there is anything we can do uh, to help expedite the process. Um, we did a petition before with 700 people signed this petition. We know this uh, was approved for uh, healthcare facilities and there was a waiver and it was done uh, within three months. So we are not sure why it's delayed for us. We work for a specialty company and we have other people who work for um, with remote processing from other um, states um, and I'm not sure why the board is not trusting um, a California pharmacist to serve the patients remotely. However, um, they allow this uh, California patients to be served by a remote uh, pharmacist who work for other states. So we are confused and we would like to know if there is anything we can do to help expedite the process. And um, thank you again for your continuing efforts to secure an author. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you for the comments. All right, this is the moderator. Next we have Jimmy Kim. And Jimmy, you'll be given three minutes to speak and a 10 second warning. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. My name is Jimmy Kim. I'm a specialty pharmacist. And I would just like to echo what Jackie Stover and Ines Anton has stated regarding the remote process. And thank you. The comments. All right, this is the moderator. Next, we have caller 123. And caller 123, you'll be given three minutes to speak and a 10 second warning. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. Um, I wanted to express my gratitude for the continued efforts that the Board of Pharmacy um, continues making and safeguarding um, both for our patients and our profession. So I'm currently reaching out to inquire about the status of where we are at with remote verification for specialty pharmacists. Um, just like the previous callers mentioned, I would appreciate an update on the progress that we have made in the area. Also, I wanted to know, um, I wanted to have an understanding of what measures the Board of Pharmacy is taking in order to protect the job market for California pharmacists. Um, I have seen firsthand companies hire remote out of state pharmacists over hiring an in state California pharmacist. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for the comments. This is the moderator. Next, I have uh, Keith Yoshizuka. And Keith, you'll be given three minutes to speak and a 10 second warning. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. Uh, 
This is Keith Yoshizuka on behalf of the California Society of Health System Pharmacists. Uh, in its report to the legislature, the uh, one of the additional Board of Pharmacy recommendations is that the board and commenters emphasize that expanding patient access to pharmacists as healthcare providers will not be fully achievable without changes to current insurance reimbursement models. The board suggests that uh, engagement with the California Department of Healthcare Services, Department of Insurance, and Department of Managed Care may be appropriate to determine what actions may be necessary to remove barriers to reimbursement for healthcare services provided by pharmacists. Now, last year, uh, AB 317, sponsored by CPHA, passed, and that was a boon to those pharmacists that provide clinical services. However, it is restricted to only those pharmacists providing services within a brick and mortar pharmacy. So unfortunately, um, those pharmacists who provide services uh, full time uh, and don't dispense any prescriptions, uh, those that work at medical clinics uh, are left high and dry uh, without a means of reimbursement. So I'd like, you know, uh, as a future agenda item uh, to possibly have some discussion around this um, because it leaves out a uh, substantial portion of those pharmacists who provide these patient uh, patient services and uh, as such would greatly improve the uh, California patients access to health care. Thank you very much. Thank you for the comments, Dr. Yoshizuka. All right, this is the moderator. Our next uh, request for public comment is CC. And CC, you'll be given three minutes to speak and a 10 second warning. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. Hello there. Hello there. I also want to lend my support to all the previous specialty pharmacists who have spoken about remote processing and also just want to let the board know that each of us speaking here uh, on this that, uh, remote processing topic represent hundreds of specialty pharmacists and techs who are waiting for some kind of response and resolution to, to that. Thank you very much. Thank you for the comments. All right, this is the moderator. Appears there's no further requests for public comment. Would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Please, Sarah, and just confirming, I know that audio connection is a little tough over there in Sacramento. There are some technical difficulties today, but is there anyone in person in Sacramento? Uh, we do now have a member of the public here in Sacramento. Okay, thank you, Corinne. All right, so with that, um, I know that this uh, has been discussed quite a bit, so I, I just wanted to provide a little bit of process comment. I usually don't respond, but um, it, it just I believe it would be helpful. So there's a legislative process and the regulatory process, and uh, when the legislative statute states certain way, there is nothing we can do to override that, and so uh, as hopefully the members no, members of attending know that the board has pursued a statutory change, which is required um, to changes in that sections remote processing uh, for for all, to allow that to happen. Uh, unfortunately, um, as our executive officer stated multiple times. The legislative session is from January through usually August, and that we weren't successful in securing an author. Um, however, um, as announced uh, and as stated before, that this will be a part of a sunset review. So I am hopeful that you all can put your effort into making sure that this can be a uh, something that will be happening next year. Um, as part of the sunset review. So please stay tuned for that. Uh, and one comment, just a reminder that the Board of Pharmacy's mandate is a consumer protection and public protection. So 
Uh, unfortunately, I understand your concerns, but that's something that uh, we, um, we, our mandate is very clear. Um, and the, um, I do want to actually discuss Dr. Yoshizuka's comments. Hopefully that we can add that to our um, discussion in the future. With that, uh, Trevor, I see your hand is up. Yeah, just to uh, follow up, because I want to show deference and respect to the people that are taking their time to to talk with us today about the remote processing. Um, just to emphasize what you said, uh, President Sung, the Board of Pharmacy doesn't act in a vacuum as it relates to uh, legislation. And so I would heavily encourage everyone um, who thank you for taking the time to talk to us, everyone uh, who feels so passionate about this issue. Um, to uh, reach out to your own legislators and talk to your own advocacy organizations. Uh, they, uh, while the board can pass recommendations, um, we do not have the power to uh, secure a co-sponsor outright. So I would encourage everyone on this call, talk to your professional organizations, talk to your advocacy organizations, and also do direct outreach to your own legislators who have a passion about this issue specifically because that will uh, be a much more effective route to start getting this sort of legislation passed, which the board supports. Um, but unfortunately, uh, we pass a lot of support for different legislation that sometimes gets picked up by a legislator, sometimes doesn't. It makes a world of difference um, if the board support is supplemented uh, by other advocacy um, at the legislature. And so, um, I just want to make sure you put that there, but yes, as, as president Sung says, uh, we, we cannot, we don't, we don't have the authority to. Single handedly secure co sponsorship, so I would encourage everyone to pursue additional routes to that. Thank you, Trevor. All right, any member comments. We are. Being not, we're ready to move on to next agenda item 3. Uh, discussion and consideration of proposed amendments to pharmacy law to transition to a more robust standard of care model for some pharmacists provided patient care services. Today, we continue our discussion on the board's legislative proposals to facilitate a transition to a more robust standard of care model for pharmacists provided patient care services. The meeting materials again detail relevant laws and regulations generally establishing the scope of practice for pharmacists. As we discuss the board's policy goal on several occasions, including most recently during the committee's July meeting, I'll not be providing background on the prior discussions, but we'll remind everyone that it is the board's intention to approve a statutory proposal and seek to work with the legislature as part of the board sunset review to implement significant statutory changes to benefit patients by establishing authority for pharmacists provided patient care consistent with a pharmacist education training and experience. As we resume our discussion, I think it is important to highlight some of the basic tenets of the public uh, of the policy goals, specifically to simplify the authorities for pharmacists providing patient centric care that aligns with pharmacists education and experience while ensuring pharmacists are not required by employers to provide services for which they believe they either have insufficient information, for example, insufficient access to patient medical information or for which they do not believe they have adequate knowledge or training to do so. A pharmacy practice settings vary. Such an approach allows the board to move forward with a policy while recognizing that not all of the authorities established in the proposal will or should be provided in all pharmacies. To quickly summarize in concept, the draft statutory language we'll be considering again today would expand provisions for pharmacists to perform CLIA wave tests beyond those currently allowed in BPC 4052.4 would allow pharmacists to perform a therapeutic interchange under specified conditions, would establish authority for pharmacists to furnish FDA approved or authorized medication that is preventative or does not require a diagnosis under specified conditions, would expand upon pharmacists current authority to administer biologics and would allow pharmacists to furnish an FDA approved or authorized non-controlled medication for the treatment of minor non-chronic health conditions or for which a CLIA wave test test provide diagnosis and the treatment is limited in duration. 
would expand current authority for pharmacists to complete missing information on a non-control medication if there is evidence to support the change, would expand authority for pharmacists to substitute medications that are generally considered interchangeable, um, such as if insurance will only cover one branded medication, but an interchangeable medication was prescribed, or vice versa, would allow for medication therapy management or chronic disease management and adjustment to treatments to manage chronic conditions diagnosed by a prescriber to optimize drug therapy, such as adjusting medication dosing in response to lab results, such as warfarin or medications to better control diabetes or cholesterol or hypertension. So as indicated in the meeting materials, the statutory proposal has been updated to incorporate additional changes to the committee identified during the July meeting. It is my hope that today we can finalize the proposal to allow for consideration by the board at the November 6th through 7th, 2024 meeting, which will be held in San Diego in advance of the required submission of the board sunset review report. As I open for discussion, I would like to ensure that members received comments from the California Society of Health and Pharmacists and the updated letter from the California Pharmacists Association. I welcome your comments. On the updated proposal, as we have dedicated significant time and consideration on this important policy issue, I'd also entertain a motion to recommend that the board through its sunset process sponsor legislation consistent with the policy goals established in the legislative proposal. We also like to remind members today, uh, the goal should not be to wordsmithing, but to have an overall uh, broad policy direction where we could all move forward together. I note that from CSHP comments, there are a few things that they bring up that I would like to include in the updated proposal um, that we can discuss um, if members are agreeable, such as uh, discussions about the few things that I will bring up, but um, I will let you all go first. Members, um, what are your thoughts? I know that this meeting could take 10 more minutes, or it could be four hours, depending on how we go today. So I will open it up for anyone who wants to go first on your general thoughts. Quiet room again. If you all want to hear from the public first, we are also okay to go there. I'm. This is more of a discussion, so um, we can open up for public comment. Uh, anyone wants to speak on this issue overall, please feel free to speak. Um, and I see someone raise their hand, but I'm not sure if they meant to, but please uh, go ahead. Did we want to move over to public comment? Sorry. <laughs> Yes, please, Sarah. Okay. Thank you. Um, this is the moderator um, at the direction of the committee. I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right-hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. And it looks like I do have a request from Mark Johnston. And Mark, you'll be given three minutes to speak in a 10-second warning. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. Uh, hello, my name is Mark Johnston, CVS Health, congratulating you for supporting expanded pharmacist practice. This is a job well done, but I have four critical technical changes to discuss, and I'm not sure I can get them done in three minutes. I thought maybe we'd have three minutes per section. Uh, I will motor mouth through this as best no, I okay, can. Mark. You, you, this is just an open comment, so you'll be able to speak more. So please just, just do what you can and... and... There will be more opportunity for comment. Thank you very much. Um, draft 4052E requires a furnishing pharmacist to notify a patient's primary care provider. Draft 40524 requires a pharmacist who performs CLIA wave tests to do so in collaboration with the patient's primary care provider. Such collaboration is not defined, but the term collaboration appears to infer some greater responsibility than just notification and could be interpreted to mean the entering of a collaborative practice agreement. 
common practice in California today does not require a pharmacist to collaborate with a primary care physician in order to administer common tests such as influenza. So the choice of this terminology adds a roadblock to care. I suggest removing this reference to collaboration from 40524 and adding CLIA wave test notification to 4052E instead to harmonize with furnishing notification. Uh, also draft 40524 references 1206.5, which in turn references 4052.1, 4052.2, 4052.4, which are proposed to be struck. Therefore, I believe revisions to 1206.5 should be included in this sunset review bill as a matter of housekeeping, as 1206.5 will refer to statutes that don't exist if your sunset bill uh, is successful as drafted. Um, I also believe that the use of the term drug therapy related tests in 1206.5 and 4052.12 are conflicting with draft 40524, as the board has interpreted this term to mean drug therapy must be in existence before the test is initiated, not in lieu of potential treatment of an otherwise healthy patient who is not engaged in current drug therapy. As an example, a drug therapy related test is a pro time in a pharmacist run Coumadin clinic but a drug therapy related test is not a CLIA waived influenza test on an otherwise healthy patient as there is no drug therapy if the test is negative. Even if the board clearly believes that a conflict does not exist between 1206.5, 504212, and 524, uh, 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 CLIA waived testing, um, clearly a pharmacist would not be able to order components of a blood panel prior to furnishing HIV prophylaxis drugs to an otherwise healthy patient. And I don't believe that is your intent. My suggestion is to remove the term drug therapy related from 40524 to allow pharmacists to order and interpret tests period and from 1206.5, which would then clearly refer to a pharmacist performing any CLIA wave test at their discretion, which I believe is your goal. Um, I'll stop there. I do have comments on immunization, but I believe my time is running out and uh, all of these comments are in reference to um, 40524, uh, basically. Thanks for the comments, Mark. All right, this is the moderator. Next, we have Keith Yoshizuka and Keith, you'll be given 3 minutes to speak and a 10 second warning. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. Thank you for the opportunity, Keith Yoshizuka, on behalf of the California Society of Health System Pharmacists. Uh, we have our written comments. Uh, I wanted to highlight and emphasize three particular points. First, uh, CSHP uh, applauds the board in their wisdom in seeking a, I believe you call it a hybrid model, uh, where you're applying standard of care for pharmacist uh, school for practice, yet uh, hard and fast, you know, rules uh, re regulating pharmacy practice. Uh, in as much, uh, we would like the to see the word pharmacy replaced with pharmacist. We're talking about services uh, being provided um, by a particular pharmacists for patient care services. Um, secondly. Um, Let's see. Um, a couple of places, uh, 4052A10 and 4052A11 uh, refers to pharmacist per furnishing, uh, but there's a um, prohibition for furnishing for off label use. Uh, according to the ASHP statement, um, several of the uh, standard of care uh, therapies. Uh, involve off-label use. Uh, for example, for the longest time, for decades, uh, you know, uh, the standard of care has been for patients to take a low-dose aspirin for prevention of uh, stroke and heart attack. Um, so it doesn't really make sense to say that you're holding the pharmacist accountable 
for a standard of care and then turning around and says, but you can't apply the standard of care if uh, it's an off-label use. So uh, in as much as um, a lot of the, many of the uh, standard of care standards are off-label use, uh, we uh, re humbly request that those two uh, lines be stricken. Lastly, uh, in the board proposal, uh, you're striking the section on repackaging of medications. Uh, we request that that section be left in, uh, particularly as it applies to long-term care pharmacy. Um, when patients are admitted to a skilled nursing facility, uh, the facilities require unit dose packaging, or in other words, blister packs. Um, often the, you know, the patients that the medications the patients were on are sent to the facility and they can't use them according to their policies and procedures. Uh, that law to allow repackaging of medications, even if dispensed by another pharmacy, allows the uh, pharmacy to Ten repackage seconds. the medication um, so that the nursing home can use it without having to incur additional re uh, expense. And the um, insurance would decline it because it's already been filled. So I, I would re request that uh, that section be left in. Thank you very much. Thank you for the comments, Dr. Yoshizuka. All right, this is the moderator, our next request for public comment, Daniel Robinson. And Daniel, you'll be given three minutes to speak and a 10 second warning. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. Uh, allowing me to comment, I'm, I'm representing the California Pharmacy Association. And I, I, I want to comment on the word uh, pharmacy practice versus pharmacist practice uh, that was just brought up by um, uh, by the previous speaker. Um, I've been a, a, a pharmacist for 48 years and throughout my professional career, I have been um, very much focused on pharmacy practice. Um, this, you know, what we have been trying to do throughout all this time through the educational process and otherwise is to improve pharmacy practice, uh, in such a way that it further benefits the uh, health and the safety of our uh, of our public. Um, with throughout the the business professions code um, under healing arts, there are references to um, medical practice, nursing practice, dental practice, optometry practice. And these are all adverbs that describe the type of practice. Um, pharmacist practice, pharmacist is a noun, and it, it just, it actually is awkward in, in that context. So um, the CPHA strongly feels that um, preserving the language that was originally part of historic legislation and, uh, that was enacted in January of 2014, that it defines pharmacy practice. And I, I do not see any reason why we need to change it at this point. I think it's served our profession well. I don't know that it's created any problems or conflicts. So, um, and I'll reserve uh, further comments uh, as we get to various uh, sections of our discussion. Thank you. Thanks for the comments, Dr. Robinson. All right, this is a moderator it appears there are no further requests for. Oh, I apologize. Uh, we do have 1 more <laughs> a couple more. Um, so next I have uh, Veronica and Veronica, uh, you'll be given 3 minutes to speak and a 10 second warning. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. Hi, good morning. This is Veronica Bandy. I'm a community pharmacist member here in the Sacramento area. I want to thank the board for taking up this task during this time. Um, I also concur with the previous speaker, uh, Dr. Robinson, um, that the, the language um, would serve us well, as well as the board well, to be the practice of pharmacy here, rather than specifically pharmacist. It would put us in line with the other uh, healthcare professionals here in the state of California. It would help ease the legislature who are not healthcare providers for the most part 
and understanding um, the changes and what it means. Um, it's already been approved as um, the practice of pharmacy in our own current um, section 4050, um, which has de clearly defined it. Um, and therefore, I think it would be better to have the overarching scope as a practice of pharmacy so that we are more in align with all the other healthcare professionals. It helps the legislature and it is more in align with national programs and national teaching and training as well. Um, so I, I strongly um, hope to, the board does see that that language that the board has already put forth and approved um, previously um, and keep the word pharmacy there. And as other comments come along, like Dr. Robbins has said, I'll come in on the chat. So I just want to make that from a community member known um, that it just makes more sense. Thank you for the comments. All right, this is the moderator. Next we have Jantine Yef Yefta Dene. And Jantine, you'll be given three minutes to speak and a 10 second warning. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. Brief background my role is that of a uh, head pharmacist or PIC within the community setting in the Southern California area. I just wanted to touch briefly on the concern of expanding the role of pharmacists, particularly in the community setting, but just in general. Um, I think there, we're currently in a situation where a lot of community pharmacies are having their hours reduced. There are pharmacies that are closing, such as Rite Aid or the CVSs within Targets. Um, and I'm concerned about the pressures that this creates for my colleagues and the profession overall that I feel is, has been struggling for a while, but particularly since the start of COVID with personal well-being, as well as the ability to just in general continue doing what they're doing in this profession. Um, in other words, staying within the profession, as well as the number of diminishing people pursuing patient-facing roles as pharmacists. Um, or you could say people pursuing a PharmD going to pharmacy school. Um, I think it is of concern to myself because I'm, I'm not seeing this going in a positive route where we're going to have pharmacists who are overtaxed, particularly pharmacists who have been through quite a bit. Um, with COVID vaccinations where they were doing the majority of the work. Um, I would ask that as we get closer to making decisions or as we go in that direction, that we make a point of hearing from people within those professions and make sure that we understand what those stakeholders are saying, as opposed to members who are, while validly expressing their concerns and voices, um, may not have a direct role within those areas of practice. I hope you're all doing well and staying safe. Wishing you and all your loved ones well. Thank you for your time. Thanks for the comments. All right, this is the moderator. Next we have Susan Bonilla. And Susan, you'll be given three minutes to speak in a 10 second warning. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. California Pharmacist Association. Um, first of all, we just really thank you for taking the thoughtfulness and time necessary for this major change. And uh, we are strongly supportive uh, as we see California in the lead as standard of care is really um, going to be sweeping the nation, we believe, um, as it's been proven to be uh, such an improvement for the profession, but most importantly for our patients. Um, I just wanted to make a few comments that really this work here around standard of care is not a, not directly related to workload, but really redefining the enforcement for the entire profession. Um, just want to also say that AB 1246 did put some guardrails in place when we're talking about those workforce uh, pressures that some are, uh, and we are concerned about that all the time, but we don't believe this uh, standard of care is the place where we are going to 
settle the, the workforce issues that are currently underway, but we do believe what the board did with a, AB 1246 uh, is something that is going to, to be able to improve those conditions and uh, gives more authority uh, to that pharmacist in charge. And we also believe that 317, AB 317, payment for clinical services, which is gonna require um, credentialing, is going to be another way that we ensure the fact that this isn't just a wholesale, hey, here's extra work on your plate, you've gotta work harder. This is really about refining um, the role and the direction that the pharmacists will be taking according to their training, according to their credentialing, according to their position uh, within their workplace. So we're happy to see the profession advance. Uh, we believe this is very, very important. We don't wanna see the profession held back. Uh, and we know that other states that have moved ahead of us haven't reported workplace abuses related to moving to standard of care. So we strongly support this move by the board. At the same time, we pursue um, many avenues uh, and want to continue to pursue avenues to improve the workplace experience for all pharmacists, no matter where they are working. But we do see those as two separate issues and are very, very encouraged and supportive of the board's movement here on standard of care. It's time for the profession to take its place, rightful place, next to the other healthcare professions. We've waited since 2013 uh, when healthcare provider status was granted. This is an enormous uh, step to actually realizing healthcare provider status in the work of pharmacists across the state of California. It's a very, very uh, landmark uh, decision that you are making and we want you to know CPHA is in full. And seconds. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. All right, this is the moderator. Next, we have Stephen Gray. And Stephen, you'll be given three minutes to speak in a 10 second warning. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. I would like to spend a moment uh, reinforcing what uh, Dr. Yoshida said about the use of uh, the word pharmacist versus the word pharmacy when talking about standard of care. Um, you know, references to what other professions have done, uh, that professions that are governed by boards that do not license facilities, do not license functions that are performed by personnel who are not pharmacist, uh, you know, is quite frankly irrelevant. Uh, the board spent a lot of time talking about uh, the standard of care for the clinical, for the professional practice of a pharmacist. The board even had discussions uh, during its um, uh, error reduction task force and other discussions about the need for more autonomy of a pharmacist in applying their professional practice responsibilities. Uh, and the board also had a lot of discussion about the need to uh, be able to uh, to actually discipline persons who quote interfere with the practice of a pharmacist, and they even mentioned interfere with the practice of a pharmacy technician. Pharmacy technician is a licensed professional under Division Two of the Business and Profession Code, and uh, there were problems with that. I think uh, emphasizing pharmacist over pharmacy is also supported by your definition you are proposing for the standard of care. You know, the standard of care is the evaluation of what a pharmacist did or should have done uh, based on a reasonably prudent other pharmacist with similar education, training, background, and setting. It, uh, it would be wrong to judge what a pharmacist did based on what another pharmacy did or what another pharmacy management allowed or did not allow or did not provide in the in terms of uh, time or uh, practice setting. So I strongly think the board should stay the course with what it's proposing, make sure that everyone understands the difference between the standard of care when you're looking at a pharmacist versus what you're looking at in, in terms of the expectation of the practice of the business of pharmacy, whether it be a community pharmacy, a hospital pharmacy, or whatever, there's a distinct difference and uh, that does not 
exist with other licensing boards. And so for clarity, for actual clarity to the legislature, to the courts and everyone else, it is important to talk about pharmacist versus pharmacy when you're talking about standard of care. You would expect a pharmacy to follow the specific rules, the prescriptive rules of what a pharmacy must do um, and, and continue to do that. Likewise, with a wholesaler, a 3PL, a EMT that has a In license seconds. with the Board of Pharmacy, uh, but a pharmacist is different, and I encourage you to emphasize that by retaining the word pharmacist, as Dr. Keith uh, Jure mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gray. All right, this is the moderator. Next, I have Clint Hopkins and Clint, you'll be given 3 minutes to speak and a 10 second warning. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. Members of the board and members of the public, uh, Dr. Clint Hopkins from Pucci's pharmacy and Eddie's pharmacy. I uh, just want to echo the sentiments of doctors Bandy and Dr. Robinson. I agree that this should remain uh, as pharmacy, not as pharmacist. Um, and I think that's very important and that um, uh, thank you all for taking this up. Thank you for the comments, Dr. Hopkins. This is the moderator. Uh, next, we have Jassy Gruwal. And Jassy, you'll be given three minutes to speak and a 10 second warning. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. Good morning, Jassy Gruwal here on behalf of the FCW Western States Council. I am our comments uh, while we're taking a fuller look into the language and able to provide specific feedback. At a future board meeting, um, on a, at a larger scale, I think UFCW has significant concerns with moving towards this model. We represent pharmacists in the retail community setting, not at independent pharmacies. And while this sounds great in theory, being able to offer more healthcare services uh, through community pharmacies, the reality on the ground just does not support the expansion of duties that are listed out here. Um, the reality that our pharmacy members have every single day is inadequate staffing, um, uh, really overburdensome workload and cutting of hours. Our members are expected to do more and more and less and less hours um, with less and less staff. And I think while we want to be able to um, uh, further the profession and be able to do all the things that are listed in this proposal, there really does need to be a fuller discussion around staffing and making sure that the pharmacist truly does have their own decision making authority in the retail setting. While AB 1286 moved us closer to this objective, it did not fully reach us there and we are still um, waiting for the impacts of that bill to be shown. And so I think there's a long way to go when it comes to the reality on the ground for retail pharmacists. And we just have significant concerns with a lot of the things that are listed here. I think overall, our biggest concern is that you're gonna have patients receiving these services at the pharmacy and not receiving the adequate care and potentially having mistakes made along the way. Um, and so we really don't wanna put patients in harm's way knowing that the, um, that our pharmacists are still overworked and overburdened. Um, I'll leave my comments there, but I'm happy to, to share further feedback from our members on this issue. Thank you for the comments, Jazzy. All right, that's just the moderator appears there are no further requests at, on WebEx at this time. Would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, thank you, Sarah. For a second, I thought we were not going to get any comments there, and I was like, uh, President uh, Ann, Moderator, I apologize. I apologize. Yes, I know, Ann. I'm going to you next. Thank you. This is a moderator. I apologize. We have another uh, hand raise. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought Veronica spoke already, but maybe different Veronica. Let me double check. Oh, yes, uh, we do did already have a comment um, okay. from Veronica. All right. we'll, 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 we'll have more opportunities a little later after we have some discussion. So we'll come back for public comment um, and then go to Anne for um, Sacramento. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, members of licensing committee. 
Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Sean Kim, uh, Senior Manager of Practice and Professional Development at CPHA. We represent all practice settings of pharmacy, um, pharmacists, pharmacy technicians, as well as student pharmacists. Uh, beyond my professional role, I'm deeply passionate and responsible for providing continuing education in pharmacy as a fa fellow pharmacist. Like other healthcare professionals, pharmacists are required to complete continuing education to maintain their licensure and certification, ensuring they are stay up to date evolving healthcare landscape. As you know, Section 4050D uh, which recognized pharmacists as healthcare providers in 2013, signed by Governor Jerry uh, Brown, SB 4493, has not yet been fully supported by the uh, necessary regulatory framework to allow pharmacists to operate at the full scope of their training and expertise. This has limited pharmacists from practicing at their highest capacity and it is crucial that the law catches up to the modern healthcare practices. A key component of this evolution is the standard of care model. This approach doesn't expand the pharmacist's scope of practice nor increasing the workflow, but instead allows them to apply their education, training, and ex experience effectively to better serve patients. By adopting this model, states like Idaho Washington have already improved their patient outcomes, particularly in underserved and rural areas. Moreover, Section 4050, the business code, a business and professional code declares pharmacy practices as a dynamic and patient-centered health, health services, continually evolving to include more comprehensive patient care activities. Pharmacy practice goes beyond simply optimizing existing therapies. It includes initiating, monitoring, and adjusting treatments to meet patient needs. Immunizations, preventive cares are examples of services where pharmacists provide direct access to essential health care. It's essential to maintain the term pharmacy practice aligning with similar language to any other professionals like medicine, nursing, dental, rather than switching to pharmacy practice. We also recognize the importance of legislative progress that aligns with the new regulatory framework, such as AB 1114, which passed 2016, ensuring that pharmacists are reimbursed for services under Medicare as medica medical providers, expanding payments for the, uh, services traditionally covered only under medical benefits. AB 317, which just passed last year, which focused on credentialing and expanding payment for pharmacists right, providing services through up. commercial insurers and increasing opportunity to bill for services under pharmacy benefits as well as medical benefits. These legislative efforts collectively support and transition to a modern regulatory environment that recognize the essential role of pharmacists in healthcare. Furthermore, APHA supports the transition to a standard of care as evidenced by their policy statement requesting state board and legislative bodies to regulate pharmacy practice. Similarly, all right, uh, this is the moderator. Uh, time is up. Um, Thank you, Sarah. And and there will be more opportunity for comment after we have discussion. Now that we've heard from um, great feedback from our public, I think that we are um, going to start our discussion. But before, I just want to make some comments. I know there were a lot of comments, but just a few things. So um, first, about the pharmacist, pharmacist. Um, I do, I do understand the concerns and comments, but um, we specifically use the word pharmacist. Um, and the reason is because pharmacy and pharmacy law is one of the most complex laws that governs the practice of pharmacy and pharmacists, as well as many other entities. And what through this 
I was just looking back at my notes and we started standard of care ad hoc committee meeting in 2022 and I don't know where the time went. But um, the, the clear conclusion we made at the committee level was that the business of practice of pharmacy, pharmacy, we wanted to make it very clear that those are governed by a clear statutory and regulatory requirement. And what we wanted to advance and reform was that there is an opportunity to change some of the practice uh, for pharmacists. And pharmacy and pharmacists, we are the, I don't know any other boards, but we, our board license both pharmacy and pharmacist license. And a lot of times, regulations and enforcement of those entities are governed in some ways tangled and untangled. So I think the intent is that we are looking at a pharmacist practice, and that's why the word pharmacist was recommended to be changed um, in that section. Um, that's the first comment, and I could be wrong. I'm open for changes, really. I, I'm really open for changes. I'm open to advancing this proposal. I really think we need to advance this proposal, which is brings to my second point that I think it's very important. Pharmacy is changing very fast, and I do believe that we need to provide opportunities for pharmacists to provide excellent patient care to patients of California. It is critical that I think we need to move forward, look forward, advance forward. We need to figure out a path forward for people to be able to be taken care of. The advancements of AI changes in so many ways how we do healthcare is creating a huge change that we probably never seen before. And we need to provide an environment where people can be taken care of, which is why I feel very passionate about this proposal, which brings to my comment about the pressures. I think anyone who knows me who's been here, seen my work and our work at the board knows how much I care about that. I care deeply about it. If a pharmacist is not able to take care of patients, that is a harm that we need to take care of and we need to address. However, pharmacy world is changing. We have to advance. We have to be able to allow those pharmacists to pivot to practice that is patient-centered, patient-focused. The dispensing model of pharmacy is not going to survive. And there will be a huge changes in the dynamics of pharmacy per capita. Uh, I am afraid there will be a, a, a lot of shutdowns of pharmacies, the business pressures. Pharmacies, as it stands today, unfortunately, probably will not make and the pharmacist care must continue. Pharmacist care must stay strong to provide care for California consumers and patients. This is why this proposal is so important. We need to look to the future. We need to allow people to be able to be cared for in the way that the best way possible for that pharmacist to make that determination that if they feel they can do it, they should be able to do it in advancing care for the patients. There are so much opportunities out there that I'm confident that this could be such a good thing for people of California. Um, and with that, I know that this is, uh, you know, just a few other things, the lab, I think, I think collaboration, that word could be better to notify um, the lab ordering and testing, I think, could be a little bit more broader um, and repackaging. I think definitely we need to keep that in place. All right, so we heard, I spoke a lot, so I'm, I'm, I think it's time for us to chat. I know that there will be um, probably some discussions, but I know it's a big proposal, but we can just uh, go around the table, just, you know, share your thoughts.
and we'll go from there. So hopefully we all have some thoughts to share. I don't know who wants to go first. All right, Jason. Jason, raise hair. Brave hand. Go ahead, Jason. Thanks, Song. I, I I think, and maybe this is just in my perspective as being a public member here, that as we started off, the idea I think of today's discussion, not wordsmithing and identifying every paragraph and every item, every word through every code section. I don't think that would serve to our advantage. I think for intent. I think standard of care model is is where the future of pharmacy is. I think that is where uh, other states are moving, and I think that would be best for us to at least identify uh, if we support. I, I do, and and how and what exactly that means in our support in a larger picture. And then this is going to be tied into sunset review. This right. is going to be put forth the legit uh, to the legislature. And at that point, I think that's when every word, comma, every I and every T will be looked at. So I think for us to do all of this advancement and cross out and identify every word that's in the code section, I don't think that is a uh, appropriate action for us to take at this time. Um, I think a larger picture, uh, a comprehensive picture of what we wish to happen uh, would best serve us and uh and uh our attendees now thank you thank you jason appreciate the comments thank you and jesse thank you um so i will start by saying that i think i've been the the one consistently um who's hesitant about this and i still have my concerns moving forward looking back on the workforce survey results you know this is a few years old but given that AB 1286 was aimed at addressing some of these issues, um, but we haven't even been through a whole flu season yet. Um, I don't think we've really seen the results of AB 1286 and how that has impacted specifically community chain pharmacists, I will say. Um, but, you know, at, at the time of the survey, 56% of PICs did not feel like they had a sufficient autonomy to fulfill their necessary requirements. 95% of community chain pharmacists were required to perform additional services. Um, I will also note that although AB 1286 did, um, did make it so that the pharmacist um, does not have to perform those services, um, a lot of pharmacists still feel like they, they have to. Either that hasn't been communicated to them well enough or they feel the pressures from their work site and feel as though they may lose their position if they don't. 78% um, of pharmacists didn't feel like they had sufficient time to provide adequate, adequate screening for immunizations. And you know, immunizations are such common practice at this point. If they don't feel like they can provide screening for that, uh, you know, I have very, very little hope for for expanded services, specifically in that setting. Um, as a preceptor, I will say that every single student I get in in my rotation um, does not want to go into retail pharmacy and specifically community pharmacy. Almost every pharmacy student at this point wants to go into industry um, that I see here. Um, and part of the reason is because of the added pressures and tasks that they they have to take on without support. And so as we continue this discussion, I'm hoping maybe we can um, try to talk about what that looks like from the ground. And I know it's going to be different on specific settings. I think there are definitely settings where the, all of these are appropriate, um, but specific to community chain settings, and knowing that we haven't even been through a whole flu or COVID season with AB 1286 in place, I have serious concerns. Um, I'll just use my store as an example. So on Friday, I, I gave nearly 30 vaccines. I had an unexpected um, leave of absence for my closing technician. Um, and so I work at a store where I get a lot of support from, from the front end. You know, we have cross-trained personnel they do the best that we can, that they can and they've been supportive throughout the year and still it's a struggle and you know this is only august we're talking 30 vaccines at a pretty low volume store i'm anticipating it's just going to get worse a couple weeks ago i had to do a hormonal contraception consultation 
That consultation probably took 20 to 30 minutes for a new patient. Um, I'm not able to really do that uh, efficiently without a second pharmacist. Realistically, if I'm in a room doing a consultation, doing tests, performing blood pressure screenings, evaluating questionnaires, um, there's no one in the pharmacy to provide patient consultations. And so I think that the staffing piece is a huge, a huge emphasis for me. I would like to see and really get feedback from working pharmacists in the, the community chain pharmacy on what has changed, if anything, since the implementation of AB 1286. Um, and then overall, generally speaking about the language, I don't really have preferences one way or the other for pharmacists versus pharmacy. Um, I will say that I do uh, agree with, I believe it was the CSHP comment regarding the repackaging. I think that's something that should, we should consider keeping as well. Um, and I'll just leave my comments there for now. Thank you, Jesse. Absolutely, absolutely um, brilliant points. Very valid. And, um, you know, it's, it, that's, this is the, uh, exactly, yeah, that's a discussion. I mean, you know, that's the concern, right? And that's, it's, it's how we move forward. And is it the, the expression, is it the egg or the chicken thing? I, I, I don't know, but, um, you know, how do we, how do we, what starts and what stops? And I think, you know, yeah, I'm just hoping that. Anyway, I think I've spoke, so I'm going to let Satinder go next. Satinder, go ahead. I think you're muted, Satinder. Satinder, you're muted. Want to make sure everybody can hear everybody's yeah, real sorry. comment. I hope you can hear me now. Yes, um, yes, we can. I was listening to uh, um, uh, other board members. Uh, you know, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we okay. can. Uh, Jason and Jesse and so on, and also um, Rosno, uh, to you, I agree that we do need to, uh, you know, move forward to the standard of care model uh, to advance the profession, and we um, expanded services and uh, and some of the callers that uh, um, spoke for it, uh, and also at the same time I agree, just like you stated. That we need to keep to keep to make sure that the pharmacists and that are not pressured to uh, perform services that they can adequately perform. So, yeah, like you Jesse pointed out, that we had the law that went into effect. We need to see the full effects of it, and we'll continue to monitor. And we definitely don't want to overwork the workforce where they can't make uh, um, you know um, the uh, clinical. Um, Decision making is compromised. With that said, um, that's just my overall comment. But there are things that I think we need to, um, you know, take into consideration as provided by the written comments. One of the things that stood out, like the collaboration, that, like you pointed out, uh, like Jesse pointed out, that the repackaging, uh, I would be for it. And also, the I think we have a CHSP that provided that the, the changes. Uh, on uh, I think it was section 15, where uh, controlled substance could be included as allowed by the FDA. So some of those things could be incorporated into it to uh, make sure that we don't make it something uh, take away some of the things that um, unintentionally that uh, already exist. So that's Thank all of the comments, the tender. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that there may be. I don't know how further or stronger, but I think that maybe there could be an opportunity to even further strengthen the section about the um, pharmacists are not required to perform these services. I understand the CPHA's comments on that section, but I do disagree. I think that statutorily it should be very clear what we're trying to do here Correct. to state so that the pharmacists are not required to perform these services and that if they are forced to do so or something along the line that you know there could be um, cease and desist there could be a you know enforcement actions or something along the line that could enforce and strengthen that section um, so that the pharmacists 
are empowered to do so, not forced to do so. I think that's the big difference, a huge difference. Um, uh, but anyway, I digress. Okay, Jesse, your hand is raised. Hi, yes, thank you, President. Oh, um, one thing I forgot to touch upon, um, which I really want to emphasize is the reimbursement piece. Um, so we know that, um, you know, there was the reimbursement piece and I want to emphasize that as we're expanding this role, I'm hoping we can tie something um, with reimbursement into this whole thing, not only for the pharmacy, but for the individual pharmacist. If we're, we're asking pharmacists to take on these additional roles, I do believe that the individual pharmacist should have some sort of reimbursement the same way that a doctor should. And I hope that we can continue um, considering that as we move this forward. Oh, that's a great comment, Jesse. I was actually thinking about um, adding a section similar to in 733 that this shall not be construed that the pharmacist must provide these services for free or something along the line that I think that this service is, um, it's the opposite of that statement that this the, there should be a, uh, a right or um, some sort of reimbursement or financial compens. I, well, I don't wanna get, I don't wanna get, Thankfully, Corinne or Anne is not here to throw a bread across the table here, so I'm just going to um, stop myself, but something along the lines of that it, this shall not be considered that pharmacists must, must provide these services for free. So uh, I think that's a great comment, Jesse. All right. Any other comments? Trevor, okay, and then Renee. Yeah, I'll just... Um... You know, uh, I my my focus uh, right now is trying to balance the the two worlds, right? Where I have sig I a hundred percent align with you, uh, uh, President O, on the need to be looking forward, uh, the need to prepare the profession to be able to serve um, in the way that it's going to need to in the in this coming century with technology being the way it is. Um, while also balancing the need to making sure that we don't overwhelm pharmacists, that we make sure they're compensated correctly, um, and we make sure that we're giving them tools to succeed and not giving, uh, you, you know, change the tools to squeeze the pharmacists themselves for, for more and more, for less and less. Um, and so, that that's the balance that I'm looking at as a public member looking for the the best consumer good is um, is that balance and so what again talking in general terms and not in the specific specificity of the language um, one thing I hope we can continue to include refine and expand upon is exactly what. Um, Vice Chair Crowley was just saying, excuse me, is uh, uh, how do we make it clear that these are tools uh, for expansion in this new era to and making sure for the pharmacists themselves and not tools for uh, pharmacy chains uh, and owners to be able to extract more for less, um, causing an undue burden. So th those are where my priorities lie uh, in supporting a final version of this. And so that's that's where my mindset is currently. Thank you, Trevor. That is excellent comment as always. Um, very, very well said. Could not have said it any better. Um, Renee? Um, yeah, thank you, Trevor, and to all the other board members speaking. I um, just sort of concur with all those comments. You've almost left nothing else to say, um, except that, you know, I do think this is, you know, like you mentioned, since 2022, been a discussion. Um, and it's, you know, really time to to move this forward. So, but certainly with, you know, the, the you know, eyes wide open. Right, then knowing the concerns um, for pharmacists, um, especially out in the uh, community retail setting. So, 
um, yeah, whatever, you know, we can discuss, but, you know, adding the um, comment about um, uh, types of reimburse, how to reimburse and, you know, this is not for free. This is not a, you know, a squeeze of pharmacists uh, knowledge, you know, further. Um, I do think some of the comments, um, you know, I know we're not particularly wordsmithing, but I just want to note that I, you know, adding the back the repackaging and probably including the controlled substances. And I don't know if we need to have a discussion about, you know, allowing off label use. Yeah. Um, those types of things, um, but uh, I, I would agree that those seem like good uh, Renee, suggestions. I'm going to put you on the spot. Would you be maybe possibly open to making a motion to uh, present this to the full board? Sure. All right. Do Is we have a slide for that? Do we have a motion <laughs> ready? to go? Maybe not. It's it's not in the slide. Oh, well, um, Karina, <laughs> sorry, do you mind jumping in? I mean, I think the motion could be as simple as um, um, approve the draft um, statutory proposal and uh, um, consistent with the discussion as a committee uh, to the full board and for sunset review process. Something very simple. Uh, Corinne, yeah, yeah. I, I think that there was some suggested language um, previously when you introduced the topic, um, something along the lines of a motion to recommend that the board through its sunset process sponsor legislation consistent with the policy goals established in the legislative proposal. Okay. You're such a great attorney, Corinne. We are just lucky to have you. That's all I can say. I'm looking through that to see that wording. Not very good. In my script, Renee, so it's probably yes. not there. Uh, but as stated by our council, should be sufficient. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to propose a motion um, as stated by council. <laughs> Sorry. That's Thank so you. Big. Thank you. Corinne, does that work? Uh, yeah. It works. I can, I can read it back if you like. Sure. Go uh, ahead. Yes, please. A, a motion to recommend that the board through its sunset process sponsor legislation consistent with the policy goals established in the legislative proposal. Okay. Yes. We have second. I don't mind seconding. I can second. I feel this is important. So I'll second actually. Um, okay. With that, um, members, any further thoughts? I know we'll talk about this at the full board meeting too. So, um, Jesse? Yeah, there are a couple of um, language concerns I have additionally. I also want to, to just double check that the, the motion stated is also um, including the discussion that we're having. Um, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Because it's a, yeah. okay. Um, so one of the issues that I've brought up at the previous meetings is in um, a pharmacist's ability to change without doctor approval, um, specifically under 4052 section five, it says, um, do not substitute. I think that language can be particularly confusing um, because when you know a doctor writes for do not substitute, um, as it states today, that's generally when a doctor wants to have a brand name medication versus a generic. And so I think we need to be considerate of the language and see if that's the specific terminology. Um, also, I, I still firmly agree or believe that a pharmacist shouldn't be able to substitute um, without the doctor approval. Now, given that there are circumstances where it's difficult to find a doctor, I would be um, be open to discussing whether there could be a specific situation in which a pharmacist would be able to substitute. So, for example, if they attempt to find to reach the doctor 
and they cannot reach the doctor. Um, and the pharmacist believes that uh, not changing it could be detrimental to the patient's health. I think in that circumstance, um, that flexibility would be welcome. I, I don't agree with it generally, though, without speaking to the doctor. But I think there are circumstances in which that would be appropriate. Okay, um, thank you. Sir. Yeah, go yeah, ahead. I think the only other thing I wanted to highlight that I agree with is just under the immunization section, um, appreciating the changes to include that, um, that that's alongside the ACIP recommendations for immunizations. Okay, thank you. I do just want to make a comment about the substitution. I, I, I am, I am, I think this is going to be a uh, very important um, options. And the reason I, I, I feel strongly about this is because such changes in health plan starting 2025, thanks to the um, Inflation Reduction Act, Medicare Part D, then as well as Medicare Advantage plans. Plan design is changing significantly that the health plans has never seen before. And that so there will be a huge drive for health plans to actually, instead of, well, this is a huge discussion, but basically the way that the things are designed, that health plans are preferred to choose medications in the formulary that are high net price drugs. Um, because that's advantages, advantages, because if they get the people to get to the catastrophic level, they don't have to pay anything. Basically, Medicare pays all the bills. Starting 2025, it flips, is my understanding. And now there will be a huge drive for health plans to prefer a cheap, cheap net price, which is why uh, certain insurance companies are essentially turning into a manufacturer, is my understanding to provide their own um, cheap price. And so if you look at FDA's purple book or FDA's guidelines, whatever it may be, these products are not even in there as an interchangeable. So this really is professional judgment and patients have really no understanding because this matter is very complex. And I think where if a pharmacist can have a, a, a discussion with a patient about that they're basically being same thing and that this is what their health plans require and that they want to get started with their treatment as soon as possible that I'm hoping the pharmacist can um, really be the change maker in getting these people medications as fast as possible to get them started. Um, doctors, everybody's everybody in this healthcare system is pressured. I think we all know that everybody um, it's it's everybody is just so burnt out by the layers that are being thrown at healthcare professionals, unnecessary burdens thrown by middlemen in healthcare, and uh, I do I do hope that this is the purpose of this section is so that the patients can get treatment sooner and faster. Um, if pharmacists feels they have enough understanding and education and discussion with the patients, um, but again I do hope that these things can happen not just for free out of out of do, uh, out of pharmacist time but some way that we could actually start having a consultation with a patient 15 minute appointments billable services that's my hope anyway i digress again sorry this is something that i thought about too much in the last 2 years so um okay um mm -hmm. any other comments before we open up for public comment Being none, I think we're ready for public comment. All right, this is a moderator and at the direction of the committee, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. And it looks like we do have a couple of requests. I'm going to go in the order received. First, I have Clint Hopkins and Clint will be given three minutes to speak and a 10 second warning. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device.
Hi, good morning again. Uh, this time I don't have a patient standing in front of me, so I'll have a minute more to, to chat. Uh, first of all, I want to just say that I love what I'm hearing from these board members. Uh, consumers should not have to miss out on the benefits of expanded pharmacy services because chain pharmacies do not adequately staff their stores. We need to make sure that um, that consumers can benefit from this and that um, that pharmacies are staffed adequately to provide these services. Uh, thank you, Dr. Crowley, for bringing that up. And then um, I also think that professional reimbursement is a fantastic idea. We should not allow the corporations, whether it's chain corporations or even independent owners, to run away with the fruits of our labors and our educations. So uh, thank you for bringing that up and um, thank you for your time today. Thank you for the comment. All right, this is the moderator. Next we have Daniel Robinson and Daniel, you'll be given three minutes to speak and a 10 second warning. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, Across the board in the health profession, but it was just mentioned, every current health profession complains about workload. Uh, they're, everybody's stressed. Uh, they're working in environments that have, have expectations that are almost beyond their ability to deliver. Uh, so we're seeing stress across the board. And I'm a little concerned that language that we're putting into our statute actually talks about things that, that, you know, pharmacist obligation, you're not obligated to do something. No health profession is obligated to do anything that they're not prepared to do, they're not qualified to do, they're not, they're not resourced to do. And um, so that, that is a labor issue, but it's not, in terms of a pharmacy professional issue, Pharmacists should only be doing things that they're qualified, uh, educated, trained, and and uh, resource to, to provide. Um, the whole concept of, uh, in, in fact, I'm not aware of anything, any new authorities that we're providing through the, this change in language. Pharmacists already have these authorities. What's changing is the environment that, uh, uh, that puts actually more of a burden on the pharmacist because now under standard of care, pharmacists should not be doing anything that falls outside of their, their abilities, um, their training, education, experience. And I also think it's very important that we add setting to the definition of standard of care. Um, if, as an example, if you went to a, a walk-in medical clinic um, and it, you had an emergency condition that they're probably assigned someplace saying, if this is an emergency, go to an emergency room. And if a physician or anybody provided care in that setting and there was a bad outcome, they would be in violation of the standard of care. So you don't provide care if you're not resourced appropriately. And if you work for an employer that is not resourcing you appropriately to provide that care, then you don't do it. And that could be a corporate decision. We're not going to be doing this as a corporation. If you work for us, you're not going to do this. And that should be part of the standard of care. So I would like to see setting put into the definition of standard of care. And I can provide some language that would be helpful. Also under um, item uh, 4052 um, 10. Uh, 10 it, seconds. Uh, I, I do believe we should add, except for diagnoses related to self-care. There are a lot of people now that are doing home self-testing. There's strep, flu, vaginal infections, UTIs, things of that sort. So patients sometimes come to us with a diagnosis so for this to say uh, preventative services that do not require a diagnosis, patients are sometimes coming to us with a diagnosis. So I'm recommending that uh, change to item 10. Thank you. Thanks for the comments. All right, this is the moderator. Next I have Jazzy Gruwal and Jazzy, you'll be given three minutes to speak in a 10 second warning. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. 
Thank you, Jazzy Graywell again with UFCW Western States Council. I um, just wanted to, to echo the support of the comments of board member Crowley. I would make a slight adjustment to the motion. Um, I, I, I think it's really important that if we move forward with this model, that there be more of an incentive model. If you are appropriately staffing your pharmacy, then you are able to do the things under the standard of care model. I think just the feedback we hear from our members and thinking about all of this playing out, if you have one pharmacist and one technician or one clerk, you sometimes don't even have a technician that's a clerk, how are you expected to do all these things on top of your day-to-day -day duties that are expected of you as a pharmacist? So uh, maybe there's a way to add some some something to the motion along the lines of what does adequate staffing look like or making sure that there is adequate staffing uh, preferably more than one pharmacist um, in the pharmacy. Um, the other thing I just wanted to, to quickly add was just wanted to also echo the support of the comments around making sure individual pharmacists are appropriately reimbursed for the, the services and that it's not going to these corporations who are not performing the services every single day, but it's going to the pharmacist and pharmacy staff who's supporting that. So it'd be great to have both of those items actually included in the motion as it moves forward to the full board. Thank you. Thank you for the comments, Jazzy. All right, this is the moderator. Next, I have Mark Johnston. And Mark, you'll be given three minutes to speak and a 10 second warning. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. Uh, thank you again, board. Mark Johnston with CVS Health. Just to quickly reiterate what I said earlier, <clears throat> um, I do believe it's important to remove the word collaboration in uh, 40524. Um, and move that to just a notification requirement in 4052E. Uh, I do think it's important to include 1206.5 um, in your sunset review so that uh, um, you perform the housekeeping of not uh, having that statute refer to statute sections that you're striking. Um, I do think it's re really important to remove drug therapy related from tests. Um, we should be able to order tests that aren't drug therapy related, but may be drug therapy related if the test is positive. I, I think that's super important. Um, and then lastly, um, the movement in BOPs uh, across America is not to tie themselves to ACIP in their sluggish process, um, but rather to allow pharmacists to immunize and administer any FDA approved immunization um, and, um, you know, not refer to ACIP uh, at all. Um, <clears throat> also, as written, 40, uh, 4052.16 would not allow a pharmacist to administer an immunization that is not ACIP recommended, even if the pharmacist received a prescription from a physician for that FDA approved immunization. Therefore, my suggestion is to remove any reference to ACIP and replace it with FDA approved um, and certainly allow a pharmacist to administer any immunization pursuant to a valid prescription. Um, thank you very much. Um, um, this is great, thank you. Thank you for the comment. All right, this is the moderator. Uh, next, we have Stephen Gray. And Stephen, you'll be given three minutes to speak and a 10 second warning. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. Thank you again for the opportunity to comment. First of all, I want to say I completely agree uh, with Dan Robinson's uh, suggestion. Um, you know, the, the legal basis for standard of care does include that the setting is appropriate for that. It could be the setting in terms of equipment. It could be the setting in terms of other resources, such as space, such as uh, privacy. It could be resources in terms of staffing. 
And so the setting or uh, and maybe add the term setting and resources so that it's clear that a pharmacist is not obligated under the law professionally to provide a service where that, op that pharmacist knows uh, that the setting is not appropriate. Uh, and that I think will cover a lot of the concern that um, was voiced about uh, staffing and that was voiced about in other discussions about you know, retail setting for certain services. Uh, and, and it also goes back to the issue of you know, the rural versus the city uh, and all of those discussions about standard of care, which is so much applied and discussed in uh, physician standard of care and, and other professionals. So I think that that needs to be added um, and we didn't get to the detail and the wordsmithing, but that is a principle that should be uh, approved by this board uh, because it's so vital to, you know, making decisions about what a pharmacist should or should not have done uh, on their own professional judgment. And it also gets to that issue of, well, if the pharmacy owner doesn't provide the proper resources uh, doesn't provide the proper setting, the equipment, uh, support, et cetera, then the pharmacy um, owner is interfering with the professional judgment of the pharmacist, which, as I mentioned earlier, has already been a principle adopted uh, very well by the Board of Pharmacy in previous statutory and regulatory language. So I want to, first of all, agree with that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the comments, Dr. Gray. All right, this is the moderator. Next, we have uh, Jantine. And Jantine, you'll be given three minutes to speak and a 10 second warning. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. Good morning. My name is Jantine, as uh, just mentioned. Again, I am a pharmacist in charge in the Southern California area. A couple of things I wanted to touch on um, primarily, or First and foremost, uh, the comment regarding pharmacists being able to vaccinate uh, with given a valid prescription. I do want to remind everyone that pharmacists practice under a, a protocol um, with a protocol set up with a one specific physician. And so it is not the concern of a prescription allowing a pharmacist to vaccinate, but their protocol. So unless that pharmacist establishes a new protocol with the prescriber who has written the prescription, I think there may be limitations. So I do believe that's something that needs to be further considered. Um, I do want to recognize what uh, Ms. Jesse Crowley and Jazzy have mentioned. Um, I think, again, there is a lot of pressure for community pharmacists and PICs. Um, while we hope that the laws that we put in place protect pharmacists and community pharmacists. The reality is that a lot of pharmacists are unaware of these laws and we're not doing a good enough job of disseminating this information. Um, the other thing is they are not protected. It, while we have laws in society, whether speeding laws, whether people should receive in theory proper trial, um, not everything goes as planned, unfortunately. And within a corporation, there are ways to move people around. So if someone is, say, um, a conscientious, has for religious reasons objected to vaccinating or personal beliefs, there, yes, they should be protected, but there are possibilities that the corporation can move them around with other reasons for that. So I, I do just want to bring to light that it's not always the reality that, number one, these pharmacists are aware of what the laws are and their protections, but also that there are pressures. And we're looking at an industry of predominantly non-residency trained pharmacists. So we are putting them in a vulnerable position where an industry that they've been working either for a little bit or a lot, that is the industry they've chosen. They cannot necessarily switch to another industry and while I understand this is a consumer protection agency, I do feel that we are reaching the point that if we are not protecting the people that are providing the service, that 
it's just inevitable that they will not be able to provide a safe service. So I do think there, Ten is, seconds. there is a need for us to revisit um, the care that we're providing them. Lastly, I do want to point out while whole healthcare professionals are under a lot of pressure, pharmacists have re received the lowest percentage raise um, for Kroger it had been less than 3%, which is inflation. Thank you for the comments. All right, this is the moderator. Next, we have Veronica and Veronica, you'll be given 3 minutes to speak and a 10 second warning. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. Uh, good morning again. And again, this is Veronica Vandy, a community pharmacist member. I want to thank the committee and Dr. O for truly acknowledging understanding that the practice the practice and standard of care for the practice of pharmacy is rapidly changing and continues to evolve, particularly here in California. Um, to address the potential workload issue, you know, I know it's important, but uh, many things in this bill would actually streamline processes to make those simple tasks less cumbersome, as previously mentioned by Dr. O. For example, the provider writing for a specific branded product to be interchanged with another therapeutically equally branded product. Um, that would save a lot of unnecessary um, time and steps in the pharmacy, which directly we can see uh, a foreseeable, some positive impact on workload. Um, this in, in turn not only helps the staffing at the pharmacy, but it directly helps the public to help protect the public, um, get their medications to them in a timely, efficient manner, um, and help to make sure that they are safe and well protected by freeing up these um, processes that need to be streamlined. So I, I greatly uh, value um, the committee for, for thinking of that process. Um, I'm also great, uh, thankful for you for being uh, thoughtful and forward thinking and acknowledging and putting in um, further thought around that there are some therapeutic agents that do not have specific FDA approval for specific diagnosis. Um, but we look at the standard of care according to national treatment guidance guidelines, they are clearly indicating those therapeutic agents even though they're not FDA approved, but according to standard treatment guidelines, they are the agent of choice to use for those specific patients. So I appreciate you guys putting more further thought around that language um, as we move forward and you move forward um, to continue to work on that specific language and wordsmithing. So um, thank you for those. Thank you for the comment. All right, this is the moderator. Appears there are no further requests for public comment. Would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, please. I believe there is a public comment in Sacramento. Any public comment in Sacramento? Yes, thank you, President Oath. Hi, this is Sean Kent from uh, CPHA again. Uh, thank you again for uh, the opportunity to speak. Um, I believe California pharmacy is on the right trajectory, uh, especially with the uh, legislative works AB 317 and then AB 1286, uh, which recently passed. I think the key is the uh, proper implementation of those legislative work. As uh, previous comments have addressed, um, we need to follow up and then the continuous quality improvement is something that we need to uh, work on all together as a profession. Um, and I believe um, the removal of section 4052D is uh, needed because it is unnecessary um, decision making process with uh, redundant language. Pharmacists, just like any other healthcare providers, uh, are already making decisions based on the risk benefit analysis uh, as part of our daily practice. And adding the provision only serves to create unnecessary liability. Uh, thank you for the um, opportunity again, and thank you so much for this discussion. Thank you for the comments, Dr. Kim. Any other comments, Anne? No other comments in Sacramento. Thank you. Thank you. All right, with the public comment, our right, members' final thoughts before we call for vote. Jesse. Yes, thank you, Sung. Um, so I did take a couple of notes. Um, I agree with some of the comments about maybe including some language about um, appropriate setting or resources. Um, also, just wanted to give 
just some specific examples for myself. You know, I said I I have a very supportive front end with where we cross trained a lot of people, um, and even knowing that if I didn't feel comfortable doing something or didn't have enough resources, I still don't have the autonomy at the store level to turn off appointments. And I think it's the same um, with most most chains that I'm aware of when I speak to pharmacists. And so even though we we do have the uh, ability to you know, um, reject providing services if we deem that, you know, the workload is too much or that we're not trained properly. We still don't have the autonomy to to decide really from the store level. Um, ultimately, um, also with the interchange, interestingly enough, I had a, a patient last evening who came in um, a regular patient who just underwent a, um, a reverse ostomy surgery. Um, they had some complications and were hospitalized for two weeks, but we received a prescription for uh, an effervescent potassium uh, product that was requiring prior authorization. Um, the patient is completely out of the medication. Now, under this proposal, I would be able to interchange with, an, with a potassium product, uh, just a regular tablet. However, not understanding the the complications that are associated with a reverse ostomy, I don't think that would have been an appropriate choice for me to interchange without reaching out to a doctor first. Um, so that's something that I just want to highlight is that there are circumstances where I think it really is vital for the pharmacist to reach out to the, the doctor before making any changes. Um, and I don't know also that, um, that another pharmacist would have made the same uh, decision in the matter had it not been a regular pharmacist, you know, had it been a floater pharmacist who didn't know the patient's situation, they may have changed it without even considering that. Um, you know, as our discussion continues with the FDA versus non-FDA approved um, products, I am more open if there's a non-FDA product that is considered standard of care. I think that's something that I would be flexible on. Um, and I, I don't know if the last comment was referring to 4050D where we added that no state agency other than the board can define or interpret pharmacy law. But I do think that is an important thing that we really need to emphasize and highlight here, as I'm, I'm sure that if this were to move forward, there is going to be a lot of opposition um, from other board state agencies and likely federal agencies. So I just wanted to highlight those things. Thank you for the comment, Jesse. And I would add onto that potassium comment. I don't think that first, I, I, I don't think um, that any pharmacist in this proposal should do anything without consulting patients. I, I don't think they should ever just change it. I mean, hopefully that, well, I mean, 2027 FAQ, we would clarify that hopefully in 2026, 2027, but the pharmacist should not just change that in my humble opinion. But again, I mean, if, if uh, that I would not, I agree that that's, that's where you have to have a discussion with a patient and that's the whole point and the perspective of this is so that um, pharmacists who have sufficient information can do so if they feel that they have a full understanding and that if they don't, then that's really, you know, probably not gonna be okay. So um, great, 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 great concept, great uh, example though that you're bringing. Thank you, Jesse. All right, any other comments? All right, we're ready for votes here. And Trevor, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you, Trevor, Renee? Yes. Thank you, Jesse. How do you vote? Yes. No. Thank you, Jesse. So, Tinder. Yes. Thank you, Jason. I have Skane song. Oh. That's right. And I vote yes. The motion passes. All right. Thank you, everyone, for a fun meeting. Thanks for making extra time for this very important proposal. I know that. We'll have a lot more to talk about at our full board meeting. And so with that, I think at our committee level, hopefully uh, we are done with our licensing uh, standard of care. So we'll see you all in um, 
about a month in our licensing committee. And we'll see you all at the full board meeting next week in Sacramento, travel safe. And thank you everyone for all you do. The meeting is adjourned.